You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the show. I'm Bill Powers and this is Mining Stock Education. Joining me today is a guest that I reached out to after hearing him talk about his macro thesis on gold on uh, several other podcasts. Um, I didn't want to bring him on to talk about gold, but specifically how he invests in the resource sector and maybe get into the, the more of the nitty gritty of how he profits uh, in the resource sector. I'm talking about M- Mike, Michael Gentile. He is based out of Canada and he has a couple decades experience as an institutional money manager, but now he's a strategic resource investor, uh, self-employed since 2018. So Michael, welcome to the show for the first time. Thanks, Bill. Pleasure to be here. So with your institutional experience, you did invest in resource stocks, I understand, as an institutional money manager. What did you take? What were the key things that you learned through that career that has helped you be successful with what you're doing now as a self-employed private investor? That's a great question. It's one I could probably talk about for, for an hour. You, you learn a lot. Uh, and, you know, Bill, in this business, you learn from your mistakes uh, over years. So 20 plus years in the commodity investing business, uh, made a lot of mistakes. And I learned uh, the best way to learn is through mistakes. Uh, so a few things I'd say one would be timing cycles are are really, really important uh, for commodity investors. So you're in the commodity business, you're a price taker. So, you know, you can be the best stock picker in the world, but if you're your commodity, you're invested in the stocks that are producing that commodity is down 50% over that three year period. You're, you're lucky to break even on those investments. You're more likely not to lose a lot of money if the commodity is down. So first of all, when you, when you pick a commodity to invest in, you want to have a positive outlook on the commodity. So that would be one. And so you can talk about the macro and different things, but really you have to understand where are we in the cycle? And is this commodity more likely than not to go up for the next three to five years? If the answer is yes, typically it's a good time to spend time picking stocks in that, in that sector, in that area of the, of the commodity market. Uh, secondly would be uh, stock selection. So you know how do you, how do you go about? So I like to look for timing the stock selection as the period of time where the companies are capital constrained. So if you're, I like to be contrarian. I've learned over the years that in the commodity sector, the best time to invest is when nobody likes it. <laughs> That's really uh, the best time to timing. My first foray into commodities was 1997. Uh, oil was $10 a barrel. I remember McLean's ran an article saying oil's going to five. It's the end of oil. Well, oil didn't go to five, it went to 140, right? Uh, but at that time you had the pick of the litter. Companies were starved for capital. Valuations were extremely depressed. Nobody cared. And so if you're the only provider of capital, the only investor willing to invest in a sector when your outlook is positive and the rest of the market is extremely negative, your likelihood of making large outsized returns is extremely high. So, so the timing of the cycle to me in commodities, you want to be a contrarian. So find a sector where you think the commodity is going up and the market disagrees. Find a point in the cycle where the pain is high, the disbelief is high, the apathy is high. And then we can move into kind of stock selection. That's a even broader a broader theme. But once you've identified those two areas, then you want to roll up your sleeves and spend six months, a year, two years, getting really intimate and knowledgeable about the commodities and the opportunities available in that sector. And there's different ways to express that that bullishness so from early stage to larger companies. But that'd be sort of how I'd approach, you know, any commodity investment or any opportunity that I would see in the market. So you don't start necessarily bottom up at the company level, you would start at the macro level and you'd want the tailwinds of a bullish uh, macro thesis for the underlying lining, lying commodity? Yeah, and I, and I say I might even start my work when the opposite, it's not bullish at all. So I got, got really excited about gold in 2015, mainly because everybody hated it. I think gold was $1,100 an ounce. People thought gold was going below 1,000. I remember going to an institutional money management conference, one of the biggest mining conferences in the world for, for gold mining and base metals mining. I was a generalist portfolio manager. So my job was not to cover commodities. I could have gone to a healthcare conference, a retail conference, an industrials conference, an airline conference. I chose to go there. And the organizer told me, you're the only generalist portfolio manager at the conference that year. So everyone else that was there, their mandate, they had to invest in gold or base metals. So that was their job and they had to be there. I was the only one that was there almost out of choice, that I could have gone anywhere, but I went there. And typically in, when cycles are good, you might have 500 to 1,000 generalist investors there. So that really told me that the, the bus was completely empty, so to speak. There was zero interest, there was total apathy. Companies were starved for capital. Valuations had come down to like 20 year lows. So off a low gold price, the multiples off that $1,100 gold were at record low valuation. So to me, I was extremely excited. So I spent three years, 15, 16, 17, even 20, 2018, doing a ton of work on the gold space, starting to make some investments in the gold space while nobody cared, right? But that laid the foundation 
for 2018 when I changed careers and got exclusively investing in the, the metals and resource space, had a huge database of companies and knowledge. When the sector started to turn, I had a very deep pool of companies and, and, and research I had done to, to deploy significant amount of capital in the sector as it started to take off. But I was investing kind of years before anybody cared, still making money because the this, school this price had stopped going down. But the real explosive returns start when the commodity starts to, starts to go up. How many companies do you have in your portfolio and what is your personal expected uh, success rate with those companies? So it depends on, on where you're on the spectrum. So I'd start my portfolio today, about 25 investments. I, I like, I am a big believer in concentration. So maybe 25 investments, maybe my, my top 10 would be more than half my portfolio, at least, and maybe higher. Um, in the early stage exploration front, I'm talking about, you know, five to $20 million market caps when you first get involved in, a, in an early stage exploration story. The failure rate of that sector is incredibly high. You know, I've made, I've made said before that if you can get four to 10 companies that you're investing in early stage exploration, make it all the way from discovery to mining, that's, you'd be the Warren Buffett of, of mining investing. The, the reality is that 95 out of 100, maybe even 99 out of 100 of early stage exploration stories that you look at or invest in will never become a mine. So the, the failure rate in the junior exploration space is basically the norm. Uh, success is the exception. So, so I'm trying to get four out of 10, three out of 10, uh, which would be significantly higher than the one out of 10 or less that most people would probably be if you just threw darts at a, at a dartboard, right? So that'd be the exploration side of things. Uh, on the, once you get the producer side, it's rarer that they fail. They'll, they'll fail from leverage or cost being too high. So if you were a gold producer in 2015 that had cash cost of $1,400 an ounce and gold fell to $1,100, well, you're going to go bankrupt pretty quick because you're burning $300 an ounce of cash every time you produce an ounce of gold. Or you're a good producer that levers up way too high and the gold price pulls back a little bit and your interest expense overwhelm the company. That's another reason why. So there's less failure in the producer side of space, um, more capital structure and, and cost structure. But in the early stage exploration space, the, the failure rate is extremely high. And the idea is how do you pick the companies that go from exploration to production and what which ones are going to be the winners? Anything you can do to increase your odds there will increase the overall returns in your portfolio. And for you, would it be management rather than even the project, the, how they talk it up? It's who's in control of the project and then running the company? It's, it's a few things. Uh, I'd say to have a successful junior exploration mining investment, you need to have good geology first. So no matter who's talking up a project, if the geology doesn't deliver and there's not enough mineable grade and scale of, of whatever commodity you're trying to produce there, it doesn't matter who's in charge, they can't, they can't turn... Uh, you know, bad geology into a mine. So geology is really important. And we can go into some of the things I look for on geology. Then you need, you know, capable, honest, competent management on the geological side. So you can have a great ore body, but if you don't have the right geology team and the honesty to go attack it in the right way and, and fully develop it and prove what's there, it can sit fallow for, for decades as well. And then another side that's often ignored on the mining side is you need a real strong and capable capital markets team because the exploration business is a cash consumption business. You're constantly burning cash. There is no revenue or cash flow coming in. So having someone that knows how to navigate the financing windows, how to properly capitalize the company, how to bring in the right type of investors versus the wrong type of investors, you need the balance between solid geology, a solid geological technical team, and solid capital markets knowledge. If you have all three of those things, that'll definitely increase your odds. Still difficult, but increasing your odds significantly of, of getting a good project all the way to becoming a good investment and becoming a mine. Well-known resource investors, Rick Rule and Doug Casey, they have taught what questions to ask management, kind of like a template. But is there some maybe non-traditional questions that you ask management frequently that my listeners could add into their repertoire of questions when they're querying management? Yeah, I think I think it's Rick Rule. It might be, I hope I'm not attributing the wrong quote to the wrong person, but I think he, and I really, I really appreciate that. It's a very really good question is, you know, when you want to ask yourself, when you're funding mining exploration, how much is it going to cost? And what am I going to know at the end? Am I going to get a yes or no answer? Am I going to have definitive answer of success or not? You don't want these open-ended situations where you're spending 20, 30, 40 million dollars just to increase your geologic understanding of the deposit. You say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm writing a check, I'm funding. What answer are you going to bring to the market on the geology? What are we able to conclude uh, you know, positively or negatively from this expiration budget? And what, how's that going to change before our next financing? Right? So what are these dollars I'm providing to you as expiration company? And how much better is it going to look if we're right on this geological model on the next financing? And therefore, what will the valuation be for the next group of investors coming in after the success? 
So I really want to ask them like very targeted questions on capital allocation. What are we spending? What's the result? What's the answer? How do we define success or failure on this? That's really important because exploration can be just open-ended funnel of money going out the door and never really having any significant answers or, or progress on that. Um, another one I focus on a lot, maybe it's my background in finance, is capital structure. Really, really important. So when I get into a story, I always go through the whole ledger. Who owns the stock? <laughs> Who's here? What's their motivations? Why are they there? What's their cost basis? Are they are they fast money Warren Clippers? Is there a ton of cheap founders paper in the stock? So you're getting in at 10, 20 cents a share, but the whole management team got issued shares at one or two cents a share. So they're up already 2,000% on their investment before you write your first check and nothing has really changed other than the company went public. Um, you know, what's the... What's the motivation of the top shareholders? Are they looking to head for the exits? Are they consistently writing checks and, and backing the company? Are they short-term or fast-term? When, when you raise money, you know comp companies need to raise money in the exploration sector all the time. So quite often, the easy money to raise is the money you don't absolutely do not want in your register. So what's the easy money to raise in mining? Two, two buckets for your Canadian viewers. Uh, there's flow-through share investing. So it's tax-advantaged flow-through shares where the investors get 50 to 70% back on their tax return for investing in high-risk expiration. Well, that's great. But if you're selling shares at 20 cents and investors are getting 70% of their money back, their cost basis is now 6 cents, right? So when that paper comes off hold, if the stock's trading at 15 cents down from 20, it still looks pretty good to me. I've made 100% or more of my money. So they're likely to be dumping the stock in the market. But it's easy money to raise because the investors are highly motivated by getting a significant tax refund. Is on charity flow through better though, Michael? Absolutely. Yeah. So charity flow through very different than actual flow through charity flow through is investor like myself wants to come in and put in a significant amount of money. And then the, they, they issue flow through shares at a premium and I buy the back end shares myself. So the, those, those tax motivated investors have pre-sold or agreed to sell in four months time, their shares to me. And therefore it removes the, the fast money out of the equation. You've, the company gets the advantage of a higher share price because the flow through shares are sold at a higher price, but they've removed the four month and a day I'm selling all my stock because I've got cheap paper in my hands as a flow through investor. So absolutely, I only look to do back end, you know, charity flow investing when I'm structuring my investments. The other type of less desirable investor, look, they, they, they provide a service and they're important for the market would be Warren Clippers. You may have heard that term before. So investors that go, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a million dollars, uh, but I want 10 cents and a full Warren at 14. Stock's trading at 12, uh, you know, four days, Four years, four months plus a day, stocks trading at 10 cents. They blow out all their shares from 10 cents all the way down to eight cents. And they hang on to the warrant as a free call option. Hope they hope you find the next Fort Knox and uh, we'll make a lot of money. But I, my capital is off the table. So again, those are the two easiest buckets of money to raise. I strongly encourage my money, my companies I'm involved in to take neither of those buckets. You know, beggars can't be choosers, but take neither and do the hard work to go find sticky, you know, long-term investors that are looking for five to 20 times their money on success. They may be willing to cut further checks in the future to fund the company and to have alignment with the, the long-term vision of management. Now, again, in bear markets, those investors are typically not available. So you've got to navigate through what you can get for a company, but be aware, eyes wide open, management teams and investors, when you're, you're getting in bed with those types of investors, your short-term return is probably going to be severely impacted by the, the fast money nature of your, of your partners in that deal. Dore Copper Mining is a premier, near-term, high-grade copper and gold redevelopment opportunity with tremendous exploration potential only 14 kilometers from the town of Shibugamu in mine-friendly Quebec. Dore Copper is debt-free and owns a 2,700-ton-per-day mill with an 8-million-ton tailings facility ready to be used. There is already power to site and it is accessible by paved highway and rail. Dore Copper aims to produce a profitable hub-and-spoke operation of over 100,000 gold equivalent ounces per year or over 60 million million pounds of copper equivalent by 2024. Because of the existing infrastructure and location, a low capex is anticipated to recommence production. Dore Copper trades under DCMC in Toronto and under DRCMF on the OTC. To learn more, go to DoreCopper.com. That's DoreCopper.com. Let's talk gold producers. Uh, you've been on other shows talking about how the gold producers actually make economic sense, whereas in historically they may not have, but it's actually a good business right now. What do you look for? What's the general profile of a gold producer that you would invest in? Yeah, so, so as, a, as, a, as a kind of disclaimer on that, for sure, I, I think that the industry went through a huge bull run in 2008 to 2012. 
gold price went, you know, from the 90s, $300 an ounce, all the way close to $200 an ounce. And that created a lot of excessiveness in the industry. So companies started acquiring mines that had very high cost structures, like a $1,500 an ounce all in sustaining cost mine. Yeah, it works at $2,000 gold, but if the gold price pulls back, it's a, it's a, it could bankrupt your company, right? They did a lot of acquisitions because they thought bigger was better, but they weren't really well thought out in terms of the returns. And there are, are there actually synergies here? We're just trying to get big for big sake. So the industry went through a huge washout in 2012 through 2018, 2019, where they cut costs, they streamlined their operations, they closed their high cost mines, cleaned up their balance sheet and started focusing on returns, which was not something the industry had focused very much on the last 10 or 15 years. You fast forward to today, these senior mining companies and the mid-level producers are, are generating free cash flow, generating real returns on equity above their cost of capital, paying dividends, and trading at you know record low valuations on a kind of 10, 20 year look back period in general, they're the lowest valuations in a long time, despite the industry being more profitable, more return focused and on better financial footing than it's been in decades. So that to me, again, as a contrarian investor, that's a really nice combination in a sector where there's a lot of apathy and a lot of interest, right? So that's really interesting to me about the mid, mid-tier producers, even the senior producers to a certain degree are, are quite attractive uh, on that setup. And so things have never been better fundamentally for the industry in a long time, yet the stocks are reflecting distressed or very disappointing valuations for those stocks. Do you invest in like a mid-tier growth producer or like a hundred million dollar just brought the first mine online? Like where do you look for within the genre of gold producers? Yeah. So my institutional money magic here was small mid cap. So my, my wheelhouse would have been sort of a hundred million to $2 billion market cap. Um, so that's where I spent most of my 20 years investing. Uh, my preferred producer investment would be a single asset, maybe a two asset producer or a single asset producer generating cash flow, bringing on a second mine to kind of de-risk the, the cash flow profile of the producer. Uh, an asset that has attributes that'll be attractive to a larger producer. So I never invest for a takeout, but I'm thinking like when I'm in a, when I'm buying an exploration company, I'm thinking which, which exploration companies have the potential to become mines. When I buy companies actually in the mining operations, I say which of these companies have the potential to be want to be acquired by a larger senior producer. So some, some producers are kind of subscale, 50, 60,000 ounces. They generate cash flow. They might be good little businesses, maybe pay dividend or generate some more cash flow, do something else, but they're never going to be attractive to Barrick or Newmont or Kirkland Lake type producers. So the ones that have that scale of 150, 200,000 ounces a year, you know, 10 year mine life, good grade, good margins, those no guarantee they get acquired, but there's there's an extra element there. And if, if they have that attribute of being that desirable to be acquired by a major, they're likely to be trading at higher valuations in the market because they're more attractive assets. So that's what I look for. Single asset producers uh, that have big potential. So they may be producing 75,000 ounces currently, but with a little more expiration, they could do an expansion to get the 150, 200,000 ounces. Uh, lots of expiration upside in the story where the story continue to grow generating good cash flow. So dilution is now off the table. So you can, you can find your expiration on your own from, from free cash flow. Uh, those are the ideal stories. And, and again, typically they're very expensive, those stories, because they're quality. In this market, you can pick off a lot of really attractive uh, stories at, at very low valuations because of the apathy we're seeing in the market. With a producer such as you just outlined, does the future growth have to be at that mine or near that mine, or could it be a different project within the company for you? Yeah, I mean, an ideal situation would be you have one asset producing 100,000 ounces a year, generating $100 million a year of free cash flow. Uh, and you've got a second asset, high quality asset in the pipeline that you've either acquired a smaller company to, to build, they have the money to do it, or you organically found it yourself. And then that free cash flow can, can double your production from 100,000 ounces to 200,000 ounces as that new mine comes onto production. So, that, so you have you know, true dilution free growth where the free cash flow of that producing mine is funding the expansion. You don't have to come back to the market like an explorer would do to constantly fund the next stage of development. So yeah, that's an ideal situation for me. And what you also see, Bill, is typically single asset producers trade at discount valuation. Because if there is a political event or uh, uh, earthquake or some kind of situation happens or disruption, political disruption, uh, that mine could be shut down. If that's your only source of cash, the whole company's lifeblood is shut off. Once you get to two mines or three mines, there's a major step up in valuation. So the, the jump from a single asset producer to a two asset or three asset producer, there is typically a bump up in valuation. And as an investor, I want, I want to capture that upside. If I can find a company that has a good first project and a second project that I really, really appreciate, that's another ideal situation for me to invest in. So of the 25 companies in your portfolio, how many would be producers? 
Uh, I'd say on a dollar basis, uh, it's about 30 to 40 percent producers, uh, 30 to 40 percent explorers. You know, early stage companies that I that I aspire, I think, have potential to become producers, or hope that they become producers. And then about five, ten percent physical gold and silver, maybe five, ten percent cash. These days, I'm increasing my cash a little bit because uh, I see some storm clouds for the market ahead. Uh, so I think I want to have a more cash. That's sort of my mix. But again, I'm I'm bottom up. It's not a hard rule. If I found eight amazing producers tomorrow that I thought were fantastic, I, my producer weight would go up. If if those got really expensive, my exploration weighting might go up. It's really about the opportunity that I see vis-a-vis the potential valuation in the future. So you mentioned uh, potential storm clouds, and we often see sell-offs in the general equities in the fall. It could be September, October. If we do see something like that this year, do you expect the miners to go down with the general equities? This has been a debate I've had for over the last few years on the show with different people's perspectives. Some people think the miners will shoot up. It, it's not going to track general equities down. What would be your take? My experience in 20 years, so I haven't lived through every single market meltdown, but I'd say in general, if it's a major market meltdown, like you saw with COVID or like you saw in 2008 or 2001 or 1997, uh, the the erection crisis, uh, typically everything will go down because the investors are getting margin called and and liquidating and and forced selling in the market. Typically what you see in in a correction is the high flying speculative stuff, the 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 tech stocks, the it's trading at 45 times sales or the the meme stocks or the cryptocurrencies or the, the really exuberant corners of the market, they'll be down, let's say the market's down 40, those will be down 70, 80, 90% likely to get completely annihilated. The you know gold price itself probably falls five or 10% because the people are liquidating, but gold is a store of value. It typically holds its value really well in a correction versus everything else getting sold off even harder. The mining equities will likely sell off as well. I would say to a lesser degree than the high flying stuff because they're less crowded. They're less, uh, you know, less like someone yells fire in a theater. Everyone's trying to rush for the door. More people are going to die or get hurt. There's no one in the theater for gold stocks. They'll still get <laughs> sold, but but they'll be less painful. So maybe they'd be down 10, 20, 30 percent. But what you would see immediately after is when, if and when the Fed likely comes back to try to put the fire out, gold will will rip higher because people will see, okay, the Fed's back again, yet again, printing more money to try to rescue the, the markets. And gold will recover its value very quickly. And the gold stocks will probably be back above the levels where they were pre-crash months or years before the other stocks recover if they ever do. You know, the, the really speculative stuff will never recover and it'll probably just get completely annihilated. But gold will be making new highs and making people money much, much faster on the back of that correction than the other sectors that will stay down for, for a lot longer. That's typically what you see in a corrective phase. So it's always good to have a bit of cash and powder ready. Uh, for those corrections, but gold is so under I would expect it to outperform on a relative basis significantly the other corners of the market that are, are really overvalued in my opinion right now. Yeah, thank you for that analysis. Okay, so we've talked about expiration stocks, producers, uh, another niche or genre within the resource sector could be companies that have outlined a resource, maybe they have some sort of economic study. Now I've seen your names in some headlines of financing with some companies and it seems like this is an area where you like to invest. Can you elaborate on your strategy for investing in companies uh, in this stage of the game? Yeah, so I think it's it's a it's a function of the unique market we're in. So I mentioned earlier the the fundamentals are are quite good for the precious metals and mining sector in general from a cash flow and evaluation and pricing perspective. Typically, and in, in, when the fundamentals are good, you know, if you, I've been investing a lot recently in companies that sort of have PEAs, preliminary economic assessments, or existing resources already defined. So they've already crossed the lexicon of can we find something of value? They're already on the other side of that, which typically is a major moment. Uh, in a mining stocks valuation, mining stocks life, typically in a bull market or a strong market for for precious metals, those PEA type assets will be trading at you know, depending on the value, 100 million, 200 million, 300 million dollar market caps because the market will say, well, you're you're one step closer to becoming a mine, so we're going to give you a significantly higher valuation than that company over there is just trying to find something, right? Uh, but what we're seeing because of the depressed valuation of the mining sector, how how few people are willing to fund any company under kind of 200 million dollar market cap these days. I'm able to find and pick off these companies that I think have $100 million, $200 million potential valuations today at $10, $20, $30 million mark caps. The valuation typically attributed to a junior explorer code that's hoping to find something. So that's really, if you can move up the quality curve and, and get a project that's much more advanced at a discount expiration multiple, why would you do that? So that's what I've been able to do. And that's why I like being contrarian, like investing in downturns, because you have those opportunities that are available to you that otherwise you would not have in other sectors currently where everything is getting fully valued on full potential. So, so that's really a function. 
Um, I'm not sure if you're asking about the, when you get into developing the mine, like actually sinking the 200 to 300 to 400 million dollars of, of capital required to build a mine, that becomes a little less exciting for investors. So your ideal outcome there is probably to be acquired, to find a project that is so attractive that a larger producer wants to build it because their cost of capital is lower. Their ability to finance it is much higher. When you get in that phase and you try to go at it alone as a junior exploration company, the team that may have found it, explored for it, defined the resource, maybe got you to a feasibility study level, it's probably not the team you want to build the asset. That's a completely different skill set. Exploration and resource definition and you know, preliminary economic assessments is a different ballgame than actually building a mine. Then you want the professional mine builders to come in, right? So I've seen, you've probably seen this too, Bill, many companies that have kind of fallen on their sword, so to speak, in terms of trying to get it all the way to first production. Some can. Most of them need to recognize either you need to upgrade the management team or, or sell to someone else who can do that more effectively. That's typically a period in the stock cycle that the stock will start to struggle because there's a lot of risks in that mind building phase. So the way you offset that is bring in the A-plus team and also keep the expiration drill bit running so you can have the expiration investors still engage with that story and, and showing them that this thing's actually going to get even bigger. It's going to be a mine today, but this thing could be significantly larger. Uh, the issue is most companies, they get they're so tight on cash to get the company to production, the mine to production, they cut back on all expiration, all other non-essential activities. And so you have a two to three year period where you're just getting updates on a construction project and, and typically investors will, will lose interest at that point in time. So I've seen with your name mentioned in some press releases that once you come in and you add uh, funding to these companies, a lot of times you can get a nice re-rate in the share price, 50, even 100%. Is that part of your expectation when you're going into these companies, just knowing that in almost an to a lesser degree, but an Eric Sprott-esque fashion, you're actually a catalyst from a marketing or communication standpoint for these companies. So, so my investment horizon bill is probably like three to 10 years in some of these things. So, you know, the, the, the markup is nice, but I, I never sell. I don't, I, I make a 19.99%. I'm sort so of- So you're not a Warren off. stripper, like you mentioned. Not a Warren stripper. And I okay. make that very clear to the companies. And you can look at my track record. Everything I do above 19, 9.9% is filed on CD. And you can see that I, I hold. So that's part of my pitch to the companies that get involved in this. Look, I want to be a partner with you. And I want my liquidity event or my cash out event to be when all the shareholders are cashed out. You know, I'm not saying I'll never sell. I might need some money sometimes to do other investments, but in general, I'm going to be there for the long haul. Um, I think the stocks go up. I don't want to give myself that much credit. I think the stocks go up because my, my name's on the top of the press release, but more a function of hopefully I'm identifying a dramatically undervalued situation. Like I said earlier, that's for whatever reasons, bear market, capital structure concerns, lack of capital, that's sort of lying for dead on the side of the road, but it's actually a really attractive asset. And maybe my involvement highlights that to other investors that have money kind of going, well, this looks like really attractive. So, you know, Mike got in at this price, but even up 50%, it still has 10, 10 times the return potential on this stock. So I'm going to, I'm going to make an investment as well. And quite often I'm also hopefully solving a problem. So, you know, when a stock is cheap, one thing I've learned 20 years, social investor, always ask yourself, why is this stock so cheap? So if you think you've got an amazing bargain and an amazing deal, why is the stock so cheap? And if you can't answer that question, maybe the stock is cheap for a reason that you don't know yet. And you're about to find out when you buy it, it's going to get even cheaper, right? Management's terrible. The geology doesn't work. Uh, there's a huge shareholder that wants to sell and you don't know about it. So I always try to identify when I talk to management, why is your stock so cheap? Well, we're out of money. That's usually the number one reason. You're out of cash. Market knows you're out of cash. They see you coming, they push your stock down until you get a financing done because the market, no one's going to buy in the market if you need cash. Second one could be you have a huge 20% shareholder who wants to exit the position and they've been publicly selling their block and the company maybe needs money as well. So you've got a large shareholder to deal with and you've got a, you know, a cash need of the company. Maybe your register is full of warrant clippers or, or fast money flow through shares and they're just pounding the stock out. Well, in that case, you want to find, but the balance sheet's in good shape. Well, in that case, you want to find out, well, how many shares do they own? <laughs> When are they going to be done selling? And I would want to come in and either clean up that overhang of stock or wait till that overhang is done and make my investment after. So, or the worst case would be, well, it's cheap because the geology is terrible. The management's terrible. They're, they're liars. They've, they've promoted the company. There's nothing there. So these are all things you need to find out before uh, you make your investment. So when I come in, hopefully I've done my homework. I'm not perfect, but I'm either removing the obstacle by bringing in the money, cleaning up the, show, the, sh the weak shares that are there, cleaning up the bad management if bad management is there, adding something to the board, adding a management member, a board member, where you're, you're improving the chances of success. So that investment's more than just a check. It's uh, removing some of the reasons why the stock may have been struggling in the past. And you do this pro bono, right? You're just in it for your own personal equity gains. Yep. 
Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm financially independent. I don't need to make a retainer or a salary in the companies that get involved. And in. I'm making a large investment from writing a you know 500 million dollar check sometimes in these companies. My my goal is that 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 value increases by five ten times by by the sweat equity that I put in and and try to kind of transform the strategy or the balance sheet or whatever is I'm again I, I'm not talented in all areas. So I count on the geologists and the technical team to do that work. But the sweat equity, the return, my return on my investment and my time is the equity. And I think if more managed teams in the mining space had more of their own equity invested alongside investors, you'd have some very different outcomes in the space. When you have managed teams that are just fully loaded with options or cheap stock, cheap founder stock, then you have a different alignment of interests, right? Because they haven't put any of their own money in. If they make a major discovery, they make tons of money. If they don't, they just start a new company. And so the investors lose. So I think it's important. I look for managed teams that are heavily invested in their stock and it has to be on a relative basis. You know, if you're if if for, if you have a hundred thousand dollars to your name and you put fifty thousand dollars in your company, that's half of your net worth. You're gonna be very very motivated, right? So so it's really about a relative basis. How how much does this matter to you in your financial position? Are you gonna be up at two o'clock in the morning solving the problems or not? Typically, it's aligned with how much equity and how much cash you have relatively in this business versus other things you might be involved in. So you mentioned that when it comes to exploration companies, if you hit four out of 10, you know, you can be the Warren Buffett of mining stock speculation. So can you share with us one of your biggest resource investing mistakes you made as an institutional money manager and also as a private investor now uh, self-employed working for yourself? Yeah, lots of mistakes. Uh, so first one I learned the hard way was cycles. So so you invest, you know, if you, if you got all gung-ho on oil when it was 110 to $120 a barrel, because the problem is, Bill, is in those points in time, it is very exciting. Oil is $110 a barrel. The company is generating record levels of free cash flow. The industry is doing fantastically well. It's on the front page of the newspaper. And so if you if you miss time the cycle, you, you invest when things look great. All of a sudden, six months later, a year later, oil is $50 or $40 a barrel. You've lost a ton of money. No matter how good your stock selection is, uh, you've lost a ton of money. Another thing I've learned being on boards that, that I probably would have spent more time looking at as an institutional investor, which I definitely do now, is... Who's on your board? So you, typically you focus on the management team. You're like, well, is the CEO any good? The CFO any good? The COO any good? The technical people any good? The boards are really, really important, especially in junior exploration companies. You may have three to four full-time employees in an exploration company, but you have six board members. So your board members outnumber your full-time employees, right? And sometimes they're paid, Michael, I've seen too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so if you have six board members that are, are working hard, that own a lot of stock, that are providing their expertise and their, their talent and energy to the company, that makes a huge difference to the mining company versus board members who just show up once every four months for a board meeting for two hours, collect their options and their retainer and go back to their previous line of business, right? Uh, so that's something that's really important. Board level management team, really important. Uh, and then also, you know, going deep on the geology, I'm not a geologist. So I rely heavily on a network of, of geologists I've developed over 20 years relationships with either sell side analysts or technically minded people that I can consult with to double check my thesis. I've spent 20 years looking at geological potential of projects, oil and gas, gold and things, but really getting a second or third opinion on the geology. If you see something interesting, relying on experts to help kind of fully vet it out, do a site visit for you to really kind of unleash any uh, or uncover any hidden, uh, hidden skeletons in the closet, so to speak. Those would be kind of three areas, but I could talk for hours about the mistakes I've made and learned okay. <laughs> investing over the years. What about for the newer investors listening to us? What would be your key warning or advice for, let's say, invest, mining investors under a year of experience? What would you say to them? Um, I would say if you're not willing to put in the time to really educate yourself, and podcasts like this and videos are really, are really important tools, but if you're not willing to put in the time both to educate yourself and also to monitor and follow your investments, I'd be careful. I would take probably a more passive approach. So if you're bullish on gold, buy the GDXJ, buy the GDX. Uh, it's not going to give you 10, 20 times your money, but it'll earn very good returns over time. And it's, it's a lower risk entry point into the sector. Picking single stocks requires effort. So it requires effort to educate yourself and also requires effort to follow these stocks and, and stay in, in the know and the news flow of these companies. So if you don't have at least 10, 20 hours a week or more to dedicate to the, the education of your, of your investing knowledge and also the, the following of the markets, you're competing with guys like myself that'll spend 60, 70 hours a week doing this for the last 20 years. So you're like playing cards with people that are way better card players than you. You can do it. I, you know, you start out, there's so much available on the internet today, so much you can learn, but you got to be willing to put the time in 
and, and to use a ski analogy, I'm not a skier, but I have a lot of friends who ski, um, you know, don't ski a triple black diamond ski hill if you've only been skiing for a month. So, so a lot of investors think because the information is available, they can start buying junior exploration stocks and, and speculate. You really don't know what you're doing and until you educate yourself. And so you're skiing down a triple black diamond ski hill. You may not die, but the odds of you hitting a tree head on are, are very, very high if you don't spend the time to educate yourself. So educating yourself, do the homework and invest according to your level of knowledge. You know, so as your, as your knowledge grows, you can take more risk, but, but please kind of align your position signing position Position sizing sizing. and what type of stocks you're going to invest in, you know, and, and know, know what you're investing in and know what the potential parameters of loss would be. So if I'm telling you expiration stocks, Warren Buffett, four to 10 ratio would be fantastic. If it's a one out of 10 for a dart at a dartboard, know if you're buying an expiration stock, your your chance of 50 to 70% loss is high. So be ready for that. Uh, also know if you get it right, you make 10, 20 times your money, but understand that the likely outcome is you're going to lose money until you find one that works and you make a lot of money. So be able to stomach that, be able to know, okay, I'm putting 5,000 or $10,000 in this, in this investment, I'm likely going to lose it all. So psychologically prepare yourself for that. Don't start spending the 10 times your money profits that you think you're going to make before you've had it. Just understand what you're investing in. If you're investing in Barrett Gold, your odds of losing all your money is very, very low. But if you're investing in an exploration company, the, the volatility and the risk of loss is much higher. So that just to be aware of what you're putting your money in before you do it. Michael, I have friends that listen to this show and then they've texted me, Bill, I'm up four times on this company. You know, you talked about what should I do? And a lot of times I said, sell, you know, because I've lost so much money. It could go higher. It could go three times higher than where you're at currently at. But especially for newer mining stock investors, I like to have them just get a taste of that, you know, 300, 400% uh, gain without having to experience a 60% loss. Although those 60% losses, those, that's where we really learn though, right? To, yep. to move forward. You, know, you got to have the pain in order to get the, the huge gains. The files in my institutional management cabinet were this thick when I lost money because you're constantly <laughs> writing what went wrong and, and like what you're putting out fires and the files where you made money were literally this thin because you had a thesis, it worked, stock went up. You spend infinitely more time on your investments that are causing you pain than you do the ones that are causing you gain. And so that's, that's, a, that's a true, true thing. So for your investors that have lost money, I used, I used to teach at university uh, moonlighting for 10 years. I told my students the best MBA or PhD you can get in finance is take $5,000 of your tuition money and put it in the market. And I hope you lose, I hope you lose it. And they'll be like, okay. what do you mean, sir? I would have lose your money. And I'm like, well, because if you lose it, you're going to learn so much more that if you put $5,000 in Bitcoin, it goes up five times. You think you're a genius, but what do you really know about Bitcoin? Probably nothing. But if you lose your money, you're going to spend a lot of time looking at what went wrong. Should I sell? What happened here? That's a real MBA or PhD education that, that money, educational money can't buy, but the school of hard knocks and the stock market will, will teach you very quickly. So when you had those small files on your wins, when you were an institut- institutional investor, you know how Rick Rule says, don't confuse a bull market with brains. Mm-hmm. Did you, how Absolutely. did you keep your ego in check to where you, you know, you didn't think you were Superman of resource investing? Uh, if you have a big ego in this business, the market will quickly humble you. <laughs> you know, it's, that's just, I've never met anybody whose ego has been sustained in this business. And so, you know, he's another analogy where, you know, if you're a doctor and you get six times out of 10, your patient survives, but four times out of 10, he or she dies, you'd lose your job very, very quickly. The reality is the mining business, I said, I'm shooting for four out of 10. The average is one out of 10. In the average stock market, if you, if you six out of 10 things you invest in work, that's almost like a Warren Buffett ratio again. So that means four times out of 10, you're going to be wrong. So, so you have to be humble in this business because you're constantly making mistakes. The market's constantly humbling you. And so I've, I've learned to be very humble. Uh, I tried to be humble before I became an investor, but the market will keep you humble. And if you're not, you're going to be very angry, a vindictive person because your, your ego will be constantly butting up against the market who will be testing you and challenging you and, and calling you out on your, on your mistakes constantly. Well, thank you for this sage advice, Michael. Uh, for listeners that want to follow you and what you're doing, uh, where can they find you on the internet? Yeah, I try to keep a pretty low uh, social media profile. I'm, I'm much more interested in spending my time researching investments and, and, and doing what I do best and do what I, I love. I have a, a LinkedIn profile. I'm relatively not that active on it. Um, I don't really do a lot of posts. I don't write a newsletter. If they want to follow me, they can go on Sadie, S-E-D-I in Canada, and they can see, look up my name. They'll see what I own and they'll see when I'm, when I'm buying new positions or what I've been doing in my existing positions. So that's a good way to, just to see what I'm really marrying myself to, getting above 9.99%. And when I do a new investment that's of scale, I typically might post something on LinkedIn, but I do try to keep a pretty low profile. I'm much more interested in, in the investment side of things than in promotion. 
So I think I've been doing this five years. You're the first guest that ever said, follow me on Sadie <laughs> to see what I'm doing. That's kind of funny. And so I'll give another recommendation for listeners. Uh, just do Google alerts, sign up for Google alerts and type in uh, Michael's name and maybe the word gold or something like that, mining stocks. And so you can get alerted from Google because Michael keeps a little profile. That's a little but, more uh, exciting than Sadie, I imagine. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Michael, really appreciate your, your honest and sage advice on today's show. So thank you for joining me. Thanks, Bill. My pleasure.